He supports us, is, gen is generally concerned about us, and wants to see us do well. We are ha so happy and proud to have him at our school. At this time, please give me, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Mr. Nathan Smith. Good morning, graduating class of 2022. My name is Mr. Smith. Perhaps you remember me. I was your English teacher freshman year. Then perhaps due to insanely loud spelling competitions, or banging on drums for six periods straight, or high decibel wall shaking Indiana Jones bomb blasts, or using sharp tools in class, or our inexplicable lack of progress in your springboard books, or filling the entire first floor of the high school building with the smell of acrylic paint, I was banished to the middle school building, where I sat in exile for three long years, waiting for the moment when my people would call me once again to wreak havoc upon the status quo, to throw caution to the wind, to go rogue and freestyle this speech. I'm just kidding, Dr. Pancoast. I have another copy. I've gone an entire year without getting written up, and I want to keep this streak going for as long as I can. I would like to start by thanking you all for selecting me to give your commencement address this morning. Whether I was your teacher in language arts, intensive reading, debate, or digital media production, I thoroughly enjoyed my time in your company, and I am honored to be with you once again as you cross into this next chapter of your lives. It's poetic that I was one of the first faces when you came into high school, and now I will be one of the last faces you see on your way out. A few more thanks are in order. I would like to thank my 2018-2019 fourth period class, specifically Brock, Brian, Cassie, Maya, Lane, Curran, Jake, Joseph, Amina, and Jonathan slash Timmy for raising my blood pressure and increasing my gray hair count. Thank you. I would like to thank Nathan Nogueras for breaking my ankles and Jeremiah Tavares for hitting a step back three in my face in front of the entire school during the teacher-student basketball game. Again, thank you. I would also like to thank Lily Lamp for keeping my classroom swear jar filled to the brim this year. Thank you, Lily. And I would like to thank someone else in this class for the most valuable piece of anonymous feedback I have ever received as a teacher. Again, thank you. The, the parents are clapping. Thank you, thank you. I'm gonna be honest with you all, this speech was difficult for me to write. Offering life advice to you all felt so big and so consequential. I kid you not when I say there were, as a true test to Mrs. H's patience, 25 drafts to this speech. I would be moving in one direction, then I'd walk through the hallway and I'd see one of you and go, oh, I need to write this for him. And then I'd see another one of you at lunch and go, oh, I forgot about her. But then I reached a conclusion. Whoever picked me to speak today didn't pick me to hear some plain, boring, generic, grab an uplifting quote and expand upon its speech. They picked me because they wanted me and all my strength and all my weakness to be present today. The same privilege you all gave me every single day in the classroom. And when I looked at it that way, I suddenly felt known, accepted, loved, and honored, and my writer's block com completely disappeared. You want to know the truth? I don't know how to tell you to be you. Your life and my life, separated by years and places of origin and a hundred other factors, are already so different. And as you grow older, your life will continue to look different than mine. If I'm honest, I don't want you to be like me or like anyone else. One of the problems with society is we base so much of our identity on things applied to us by other people, whether those are work roles or social status symbols or accomplishments or ideologies. When you walk out these doors, there will be a thousand voices in a thousand places telling you to conform, to be like someone else, to want what someone else wants, to evaluate yourself using their metrics. But my wish for you this morning is that you learn to be uniquely, powerfully, radically, and frustratingly you. Here's the thing. I love myself. Not in a narcissistic way, but I actually enjoy the person I was, the person I am, and the person I'm becoming. For those that know me, it probably won't surprise you to know that there's a part of me that deeply resonates with producer, rapper, fashion designer, architect, and former presidential candidate Kanye West. For the longest time, I couldn't fully understand why. His life choices and my choices don't exactly align. All I knew is we shared a common trait. We were both, we are both, insanely confident in who we are, and we both have a deep sense of purpose regarding what we are on this earth to do. 
The roots of this connection didn't fully click until I watched the new behind-the-scenes Netflix documentary on Kanye that came out a couple months ago. When I saw Kanye interact with his mother, Donda, I saw the way she looked at him when he dreamed, and I instantly knew our confidence came from the same place, our mothers. From the time I was a kid to this day, anything I created went straight to my mom. She was my first audience, my first editor, my first critic. She studied what I made and praised it and adored it and championed it, even if she didn't agree with it. She loved it because I made it. She loved that I wasn't living a stationary life. She loved that I was contributing to the world. And she loved that I was exploring who I was and who I could be. She saw the flaws and the impulsiveness and the frustration that came prepackaged in her ADHD son. But she looked past them. She loved me, and because she loved me over time, I loved me. And so to this day, in full Kanye fashion, I adore me some me. I love the things I create. I love the ways I fail. I love the tries I attempt. I love how tall I am. I love my skin tone. I love this big mole on the side of my face. I love being me. Now you may be saying to yourself, wow, Mr. Smith, you're really, you're really going to stand there on my day and talk about how much you love yourself. You're taking our day and making it about you? And my answer to that is yes, but emphatically no. Believe me, I'm not making this socially unacceptable confession so you can know how much I love myself. I'm sharing this because I want you to leave this room today knowing that life is more than receiving love from others. It is also learning to love and accept yourself in all your complexity and fullness, not selfishness, not narcissism. Today I'm talking about something else, something else entirely different. Take a look at this scale. As you can see, there are three categories, self-hate, self-love, and self-worship. On the left, we have self-hate. That's where you can't stand yourself, or you wonder why anybody would want you around, or for most of us, you A, create impossibly high and totally unrealistic expectations for yourself, B, you fall miserably short of those expectations, and C, you allow the shame to consume you and drive you. When it comes to self-hate, you hyperanalyze your eyes and your nose and your laugh and your work and your interactions and your social media presence and your friends and your achievements, and you put all those through the most critical and condemning lens imaginable. If that's you, you're not alone. Some of the most successful people in the world use self-hate as fuel to achieve their goals. There have been seasons in my life where I sat in self-hate and used it to drive me forward. It wasn't the cleanest or the prettiest fuel. In fact, it was cruel and unforgiving, but it worked, and there were times I felt like it was all I had. Maybe some of you have used self-hate in a similar way. On the other end of the spectrum is self-worship. This is when our love for self evolves into self-centered pride. It's when we position ourselves above others, when our wants supersede others' needs, when we perceive any and all accountability as a threat, when we wake up in the morning thinking about us and go through our day thinking about us, and we go to bed thinking about us. This is where Kanye sits and where I sit and where you sit during some of our worst moments. And just like self-hate, self-worship can be quite effective at making us feel powerful and moving us forward. But as effective as these two terms, one deprived of love and the other distorting it may be in the short run, in the long run they wreak havoc on our world. They take us to extremes and put us at war with ourselves and at war with others. Which brings us to the middle term, self-love. Self-love is, is valuing and appreciating the life you have. It's accepting your limitations and treating yourself with kindness. It's allowing yourself to be part of the conversation. It's applying the right kind of pressure to get you where you want to go. It's a love that starts with you but spills over to those around you. When you practice self-love, huge commands like love your neighbor as yourself become that much more powerful because the more love and grace you extend to yourself, the more love and grace you are then able to extend to those around you. Unlike self-hate, which is driven by tearing you down, self-love encourages you. Unlike self-worship, which puffs you up into something you're not, Self-love bravely acknowledges and accepts who you are. Some of you are saying to yourself right now, okay, Mr. Smith, I got it. I love myself, cool, mission accomplished. But I'm telling you more likely than not, you will visit these three places and may even spend entire periods of your life in one of them. Additionally, people will come into your life who will seek to destroy or manipulate your self-image, people who speak words of condemnation over you, people who create lies designed to lead you down the wrong path, people who use little pieces of the truth to attack you, and these people may even be you. In those moments, you will feel the pull to choose self-hate, to turn against yourself, to use yourself as kindling for the fire of your ambition. In those moments, you will feel the pull to choose self-worship, to spend your life trying to prove to everyone just how superhuman you are, to use others as kindling for the fire of your ambition. 
But I want you to know, having lived through all three phases, one of these is better than the other two. When this world inevitably tries to tear you down, there are few forces more powerful than a genuine, loving understanding of yourself, a humble appreciation for who you are and what you do and how you uniquely do it. When you are lost and you can't find your way, self-love can be the compass that offers you direction. When life is devastating and dark, self-love can be the, guide, the light that guides you home. Self-love isn't just loving yourself in some new agey way or covering up your issues. It's loving yourself enough to accept the sometimes ugly truth of who you are, flaws and all, rather than who you perceive yourself to be or who you wish yourself to be. Self-love isn't blindly loving one version of yourself for the rest of your life. It's loving yourself through version after version after version after version and chapter after chapter after chapter and seeking to grow every step of the way. And you can't fully love yourself if the self you love is a product of self-deceit. Self it's like loving a photoshopped version of yourself that bears your resemblance but lacks your complexity. It's like creating a deep fake to be presented when your full, real, beautiful self already exists to be loved. When new circumstances and new pressures come, you may not have the same support systems that you used to have. Your old support systems may not be enough. The things that used to work may not work. When you fail massively and consequences arrive, there won't be an email home or a serious chat with Mr. Don Smith, Mrs. Casey, or Dr. Pankos. Life is going to come at you hard, and some people are unrelenting, unkind, and unaccommodating. If you don't love yourself enough to get real with yourself now, to address past trauma, to accept constructive criticism, to recognize your limitations, to build relationships with care, to take responsibility for your actions, then there's a lot of pain coming your way pain that will bend you and contort you in unnatural ways, pain that will drive you to self-hate and self-worship. The war between these states of existence will always rage inside you. And failure and shame and loss and despair and success and power and strength and hope will test you and tempt you in ways you cannot imagine. But again, it's your job, it's your responsibility, it's your choice which state of existence you will call home. No matter what, I encourage you to extend yourself plenty and plenty of grace as you experience the lows of self-hatred and the artificial highs of self-worship and the genuine joy of self-love. In closing, we all know grown people who are 40 but act like they're five years old. You've also probably met five-year-olds who act like they are 40. A couple years back, I wasn't satisfied with the dictionary definitions of adult, so I created my own. Being an adult is the ability to apply pressure to oneself. To go by my definition, a person isn't a real adult until they comply, apply pressure to themselves, waking up in time to go to work, paying your bills, resisting harmful impulses, choosing to get an assignment done instead of playing video games, treating people around you with kindness and respect, even if you don't want to. But as I assessed my definition in action, however, I realized that when it comes to the notion of self-love, there's an additional word that needs to be added to complete the picture. Being an adult is the ability to apply healthy pressure to oneself. I need you all to hear this loud and clear because for years, some of you have been applying insane, crippling, life-altering pressure. I don't know why I looked over here. Life-altering pressure on yourself because it was the only way you knew to make it through. And the difficult truth, that may work wonders in elementary, middle, and high school. And it may even push you into great success into your adult, in your adult life. But my question's to you. If you continue on that same path, when you get to age 25, 30, age 35, will you be happy and whole? Will you have offered yourself the generous love you deserve? Will you have shown the overflow of that love to others? It's okay to aim for perfection, but in no way should you judge yourself by that impossible standard. You don't have to have it all together to be high achieving. You don't have to have it all together to make a positive impact in the world. You don't have to have it all together to be a positive force to be reckoned with. You don't have to have it all together to be the hero that defeats the villain. You don't have to pull it all together to be accepted and appreciated and find a place to call home. Some of, this, some of you in this room have been strangling yourself for 12 years to get the job done and make other people happy, but I'm here to annoy you by asking, is that healthy for you? Is it showing yourself self-love? Is that the kind of pressure that you want for another 12 years for the rest of your life? There are many, many things in life that will slow you down. There will be many, many times your selfish choices will cause others pain. And there will be many, many occasions where you let yourself and others down. But the only thing that can stop you is to stop loving you, to stop learning about you, and to stop showing yourself the grace you deserve. For some of you, you may need to stay right here in Central Florida. 
For others like me, you may need to move a thousand miles away from home. I love my hometown and my home state of, and James family, you can like plug up your ears right now. My home state of Ohio. I'm, I'm so sorry. I cursed. But that place and who I am are simply not compatible. Ohio helped shape me into who I am, but it is not who I am. And if my wife and I hadn't made that risky decision to move away from friends and family and jobs and all we had ever known, we wouldn't have the beautiful family we have today. We wouldn't have impacted our community in the ways we have. And most relevant, you and I would have never met, and I wouldn't be giving you this speech. The world desperately, desperately needs you to be you. The world desperately desperately needs you to love you. Your choice to do so or not will determine the unique and exciting people you meet, the relationships you have, the family you build, the adventures you go on, the awesome things you accomplish, and ultimately, the person you become. Every person in this room is here because we want to see you reach your highest potential, with healthy pressure, of course. We love you, class of 2022, and we think you should love you too, like Kanye loves Kanye. Seriously, don't worry about making us proud. Listen to yourself. Choose to love yourself through highs and lows. Be adults who apply healthy pressure, and then make yourself proud. And rest assured, we'll be proud of you too. Okay, one last thing. Graduates, please stand. Place your right hand in the air and place one hand on your left knee. Graduates, by the power vested in me by the kneecapping ninja society, I hereby declare each of you a kneecapping ninja. May you inflict great pain on the kneecaps of your enemies. Congratulations, class of 2022.